Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on where you are joining us today from different parts of the world. And thank you very much for being with us. I am terribly excited to announce that we are uh, launching a new uh, conversation series. And today we will be talking about uh, the Sufis, uh, the legendary mystics of the Ottoman Empire, with the help of our dear colleague and friend, uh, John Curry. Before I um, uh, get into the questions and know more about uh, Dr. Curry, I just would like to say a few things about uh, about um, the about this uh, uh, this uh, initiative. Uh, first of all, first of all, this uh, talk series uh, is meant uh, uh, for uh, general public. Uh, non-specialist uh, by saying that I just would like to um, you know uh, reduce the expectations academic expectations from uh, this uh, series uh, simply because of the fact that you know in especially in the United States uh, we scholars uh, complaining about uh, the fact that you know in academia we uh, produce a great deal of knowledge uh, scholarship on um, the Middle Eastern studies in general and Ottoman studies in particular, but that knowledge somehow does not trickle down uh, to the general uh, public, uh, including but not limited to college students or, or, or general history enthusiasts. So in that regard, I hope this uh, talk is going to help um, general public to understand uh, and then to get some of the uh, tidbit wisdoms uh, from the uh, scholarship produced in academia, and 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 uh, and toward that end, uh, we will do our best not to use too technical terms, too many technical terms, and not to get into also gory details of academic discussions. And secondly, uh, secondly, our conversations uh, will uh, place humans and human histories at the center. What do I mean by that? As the title suggests, um, I am inspired by uh, other ideas, uh, mainly two things, two ideas. One is the uh, project, uh, grossly, uh, hugely successful project of uh, Brandon uh, Stanton's Humans of New York, where uh, he began to photograph and then document uh, human histories uh, human stories, rather, uh, and and then find some commonalities among those stories. And today, that project that began almost like ten years ago, and today it has close to uh, you know close to like eighteen million followers on Facebook only. And his book, you know, turned to be uh, turned to be a uh, you know, New York Times uh, bestseller. The idea behind that uh, project was to again uh, look at human. Uh, stories and normally uh, when we uh, you know uh, think uh, or, or, or see that uh, uh, you know like he loves you know, street interviews are usually funny uh, that you know uh, some sort of J talk uh, interviews uh, but this gentleman uh, approached uh, tens of thousands of uh, New Yorkers in different time periods and then listen to their stories by not necessarily finding a great philosophy or wisdom in their talk, but by just listening to their uh, stories. And those stories are the ones which uh, makes us unique uh, and separate from each other. Uh, so in that regard, uh, you know, that goes uh, very well along the line with the idea that we humans, we homo sapiens, are at the same time homo nerds, meaning we are the ones who are storytellers for thousands of years, if not hundreds of thousands of years. We humans, you know, tell stories uh, and then transmit our uh, experience, human experience, or uh, or or hundreds and thousands of generations. So, so, in that regard, part of this project is about like the stories, which makes us unique, which makes them unique. And my second inspiration uh, when I was kind of thinking about this project and designing about this project is. The course that I'm teaching this semester, uh, this year, uh, at Honors College called Human Situation, where with a team of scholars, 
we are uh, we are just reading uh, classical texts uh, from uh, the East and West, and then trying to find some common elements, some common humanity, some common big questions and answers, uh, entertained by uh, great minds from the East and West. Uh, we literally looking at, for example, Gilgamesh or Homer or Plato or or, or Yunus Emre or William Blake or Ibn Khaldun or Montesquieu or Shakespeare or or, or, or even Najib Mahfuz uh, and to find those universal uh, elements, uh, 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 you know, universal elements in those ideas. So in that regard, um, while the first project is mainly dealing with particulars, the uh, second, uh, my second inspiration is dealing with uh, universals. And we humans, in a way, uh, are somewhere in between. We are, I mean, part of us is uh, placed or situated in uh, particulars, um, and yet other part of us is situated in universals. So we are somewhere in between. We are oscillating somewhere in between. Uh, but at the end of the day, when we look at the stories, uh, unique human stories, or big questions entertained by great minds, uh, I think you know uh, all of our human endeavors are come down to boil down to two major things. Two major questions around. Uh, first, who are we? And second, how how we should live? How should how, how uh, we should live in this in this world? So this is the story of us. Uh, and uh, as I said, um, this series is going to basically um, entertain uh, with uh, these uh, two questions along 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 the way. Um, we uh, are beginning this series with the Sufis, uh, with the assumptions that they were the people who um, had, uh, have had like interest into these two uh, big uh, questions, like you know, who are we and then how should we live in this in this world? Uh, and uh, in this conversation, as I said, our um, our, our, our dear friend uh, John Curry is going to help us. And as I said earlier. Uh, Sufism or Sufis or Sufi practices uh, were such a common thing in the Ottoman Empire uh, that uh, the, the legend has it that you know by the end of the Ottoman Empire, only in Istanbul, uh, there existed uh, close to 400 Sufi lodges, uh, which was a clear sign of the commonality of this practice uh, uh, in the uh, uh, Ottoman Empire. Of course, by uh, Ottoman Empire, when the Ottoman Empire, we have to define that briefly as well. Uh, it's an empire which was born in the 14th century in Anatolia as a small principality and turned into a, a great empire uh, after capturing Constantinople in 1453 uh, and by the, by, by the 16th century turned to be a global uh, empire. Uh, and by the end of the 18th century, it began to shrink but survived until 19. Uh, 20s. So basically, we are talking about a big swath of land uh, stretching from Atlantic Ocean to Indian Ocean, uh, depending on uh, different times. So when we talk, we have to also keep that in mind that we are talking about um, uh, shifting borders of the Ottoman Empire in different sizes in, in different times. So who are the uh, who are these people then? Uh, what do they do? Uh, how are they spending their time? How were they different from regular Muslims uh, in the uh, empire or in the larger Islamic world? Uh, anyways, um, so these are like some of the, some of what were like some of their ideas uh, and practices, uh, etc. So these are some of the questions that we are going to be uh, entertaining today. Uh, and uh, without uh, further ado, I just would like to invite Dr. Curry to the podium to the uh, spotlight. Uh, to share uh, his wisdom and his uh, experience with us. But even before that, maybe uh, I should say one more thing um, that my thanks are in due. Uh, last but not the least, I just would like to thank also uh, UNICEF Institute and its director, uh, Harit Bullet, who invited me to launch this uh, talk series. Okay, without further ado, now uh, Dr. John Curry. Uh, who is uh, an eminent scholar, a prominent scholar on Ottoman Sufism, 
who wrote several books on the subject and, uh, uh, and articles too, obviously, gave several interviews and, uh, and, then, uh, and uh, talks. And currently, uh, he is teaching at uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, on various subjects uh, uh, stretching from, uh, ranging from uh, world history to Islamic and Ottoman, Ottoman history. Okay, Dr. Uh, Curry, uh, in keeping with the trust of this special uh, talk series, uh, I want to uh, start uh, talking uh, about you first. I mean, who are you? Uh, can you please tell us a bit more about yourselves and how uh, did you develop an interest into this subject? And how was your experience with like studying this subject or, or these people? Uh, how was, how was, again, who are you to begin with? And uh, how was, how did you develop an interest into the subject? Uh, yeah, before I proceed, um, I did uh, want to uh, offer my uh, uh, thanks and gratitude to the Eunice Emre uh, Institute for uh, uh, hosting me. Um, also, since this is the uh, first uh, podcast in this series, I'm always tempted to uh, start with a famous uh, Sufi expression that often begins any kind of lengthy discussion, which is this poor one full of faults, uh, as they would say mm -hmm. in um, old Ottoman Turkish. Um, so hopefully I will uh, do my best uh, uh, to, to not be uh, too full of faults here, despite the fact that I probably will. Um, I, I did have a few images that might uh, uh, help to uh, conceptualize some of the things that uh, uh, Jengiz was uh, talking about. Um, so I'm going to try and put this up. Um, uh, let me know if it works. Um, can you see it, Jengiz? Yes, yes, yes. It is perfectly visible. Thank you. Okay, um, then I will uh, keep it uh, like this, uh, and uh, hopefully it will uh, help out. Um, uh, to start with, um, I'm a scholar of the Ottoman uh, Empire primarily, um, which, as uh, uh, Jenkins pointed out, uh, is a massive geographical uh, entity. This is always the classic map. Um, that I show my students in class sort of documenting how the empire emerges in the 14th century and then spreads across uh, three continents and controls much of the Mediterranean and the Black Sea region. Um, so we're dealing with a, uh, uh, a very diverse, uh, very geographically complex imperial dominion. And the reason that's important is because the kinds of Sufi figures that I look at and that I encounter um, are often as diverse as the geographical regions and ecologies uh, that they come from. And uh, so the question then becomes, uh, you know, who am I and how did I happen to get into this particular subject? Uh, well, the, the reality is I didn't start my career um, as somebody who studied uh, uh, Turkish uh, culture or the Ottomans. Um, I actually got my start studying um, Arabic uh, and uh, uh, the broader history of the Islamic world um, with uh, Carl Petrie at uh, Northwestern University. Uh, and then eventually I uh, went to uh, the Ohio State University uh, and worked with uh, uh, Jane Hathaway, Carter Hindley, and uh, other uh, scholars there, Stephen T. Dale, who did the Mughals of India. Uh, and uh, there I sort of became an Ottomanist, sort of building off my early earlier studies in Arabic. So Sufism was a good fit because I had already looked at kind of the Arabic and the uh, religious literature and things like this already. And then I could integrate it into the study of uh, Turkish and uh, the uh, Ottoman context as well. Um, this eventually uh, led me to begin uh, working with uh, the Sufis. Um, and not only did I uh, work with sort of the uh, manuscript and the uh, historical uh, literature that's out there, um, I also eventually realized that places like Istanbul and some of the more rural town environments of uh, Anatolia um, in central Turkey today 
uh, were full of all kinds of material remnants, like the uh, Sufi tombstones that you see here. Uh, and I was able to use this sort of mixture of various kinds of Sufi sources and remnants to begin uh, 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 piecing together a narrative um, about uh, the Ottoman Empire and uh, the ways in which Sufism, as Genghis has pointed out, uh, was a major social presence um, in that particular uh, context um, up into uh, up until uh, the Republican period, uh, where uh, it was uh, sort of semi-prescribed. Um, but it started to come back in a big way in recent years with some of the uh, political and social changes uh, in Turkey. And so uh, I happened to arrive on the research scene to work on this topic uh, right as these changes were beginning. And so I sort of went from one person sort of you know, interested in working on this uh, material, uh, at least outside of Turkey itself, um, to uh, someone who was uh, quickly joined by a variety of different people um, who were uh, interested in it. Uh, and uh, so uh, from that point forward, I eventually sort of developed a series of studies on uh, Sufism in particular in the Ottoman Empire. And uh, one of the major um, Sufi orders, a sort of group of Sufis arranged around a certain kind of teaching um, and leadership that comes from sort of an initiatic uh, founder, uh, was an order known as the Halveti, um, whose primary uh, practice uh, was to withdraw into uh, long periods of isolation um, to sort of deepen one's mystical experience. And in the pictures you can hopefully see here on the right, um, this is a major Halveti mosque in the town of Castamono. And if you look closely, um, you can kind of see in the back of the uh, mosque there on the various levels, little doors, leading into sort of tiny square cells uh, where you can sort of retreat, close the door, and spend long periods of time in uh, 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 solitude and darkness to begin to kind of learn uh, uh, more about your, or develop more your relationship uh, with God. Um, the basics of Sufism we'll get into uh, uh, in a minute here, um, but uh, one of the things I learned about Halveti Sufi practice uh, was that it was based on several key concepts. And here we have to keep in mind that Sufism is not a different kind of sect of Islam like Sunni or Shia. Um, it's more of a sort of method of practice. Um, in a way in which you approach the religious tradition. And it doesn't particularly matter what sect you belong to. Um, you can have your own sort of form of Sufism based on your sort of personal relationship with a sheikh and a uh, teacher uh, of the uh, various kinds of Sufi paths. And in the case of the Halveti, uh, they based their path on what was called the Adwara Sabah, which basically means the seven stages. Um, and the early stages are basically devoted to trying to recognize um, your sinful behavior, um, your uh, bad nature, and to attack that and to sort of eventually strip that away from your personality. And then from there, you move to acquiring various kinds of virtues, uh, the simpler ones at first, and then more complex forms of virtue that require a bit more challenge. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you eventually begin to go into these lengthy 40-day retreats into solitude to sort of ponder um, your progress on these, uh, on these paths. Uh, and in so this Arabayin, as it was called, the 40-day retreat, sort of marked the point where you could uh, move into a position of becoming more uh, drawn into the proximity of the divine essence that's sort of all around us and is sort of part of our everyday life. 
And in particular, often in these 40 day retreats, you would go without much in the way of food or drink or any kind of uh, human contact. And you would often sort of go into you know, sleep or in, and see various kinds of vivid dream visions that then could be interpreted by your shape or guidance as to how to proceed. Uh, and uh, in this regard, the Halveti sort of grew out of earlier uh, 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 Sufi groupings, um, primarily in Iraq, uh, an order known as the Sufi order, which spawned a lot of the different orders um, that moved into the Ottoman Empire, India, and other places in the Islamic world. Um, they seem to lie at the foundation of this as well. And John, before getting into these, John, before getting into these yeah. like, you know, technical uh, uh, details about the Sufi uh, history, Sufi traditional history. Um, let's just, you know, start perhaps like, you know, some other basic questions, uh, some basic definitions, since again, this series is like meant for general audience, and then we'll come to hmm. general history uh, of Sufism in a, in a moment. Um, as, as, as we said, I mean, you know, it is such a common uh, practice in the uh, Ottoman Empire, uh, particularly, uh, that would be also the case in Safavids and Mukhads and in other Islamic empires uh, too. Uh, but since we are talking about the Ottomans, I mean, if, uh, yes, we don't have an Ottoman street today, but imagine that we have, uh, and then you just go to go out uh, in urban or rural settings. I mean, what are the likelihood of like you are meeting with, say, uh, people, uh, and then the chance that they are being Sufi? I mean, were they men, women, children, or all, uh, they were like in, the, in, in, like, you know, in urban settings or in rural settings. Again, that's, I'm wondering, again, when you go out uh, in the Ottoman Empire, what is the likelihood of you are meeting with them? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, th this picture you see here um, is actually uh, right uh, across from uh, Tokkapa Palace um, in Istanbul, which is where the Ottoman uh, rulers uh, had their uh, seat of, uh, of, of power for much of the Ottoman Empire's mm -hmm. history. Um, so uh, what you see here is sort of the graveyard and the, the tomb mm -hmm. complex of one of these Sufi leaders. Um, was really perched right outside the gate of the Ottoman Empire, in very close proximity mm -hmm. to the uh, various markets and the sort of uh, centers of um, people from all walks of life sort mm -hmm. of coming and going uh, around the palace and the great Hagia Sophia Mosque mm -hmm. and the Blue Mosque and all of these mm -hmm. places. So we can sort of see that they're sort of just right there along with everybody else with a sort of permanent fixture. And uh, and while the lodge has since been torn down, that would have been there too, where the Sufi Sheikh lived. Um, and there were probably, as Jenk has pointed mm -hmm. out, you know, hundreds of these kinds of uh, uh, places or even just local Sufis kind of living in their own home somewhere in a neighborhood. So the chances that you would run into them were probably pretty high in a place like um, Istanbul. Uh, now, if you go out more to um, uh, the rural areas, this is uh, the uh, a famous uh, Sufi complex um, in Kastamonu um, that I shot from on top of a uh, old fortress in the center of town, yeah. that was, uh, sort awesome. of the, the center of defense. And uh, what you see here is uh, uh, the dome in the middle of the picture is the Sufi founder's tomb. You can see the mosque in the background with the minaret. And then to the right of that is the building that would have been the Sufi uh, leader's uh, home and lodge where he would uh, host followers and the like. Um, now, you can kind of see in the background of the picture, the road is sort of going off into uh, the countryside. So these kinds of places were often located on the um, uh, edges of town or just outside of it. Um, but nevertheless, they were sort of important parts of the uh, uh, local culture and, uh, uh, and infrastructure. And people were always coming and going from 
the kind of central regions of town out mm -hmm. to these places um, for various worship or to uh, gain the assistance of the sheikh as a kind of a local and social leader. Um, so the John, chances John, that sorry to interrupt again. I mean, we have some demands from the uh, audience saying that can you just switch to the uh, full screen mode if you can? Depending yeah, they are the not able to full see. screen mode. Yeah, if you can. I yeah, think, uh, uh, let me see if I can um, figure out how to do this. Um, um, yeah, I'll here we go. Let me cycle through to uh, the right picture here. Uh, yeah. And yeah, there we go. How's that? Um, I think audience should say anyone who are watching us. Yeah, it doesn't work. Uh, can you just do like an uh, Alt uh, F5? Okay. Alt F5. Uh, I just uh, went ahead and did that. Does it work? I think, well, all right. I mean, if it does work, just let's not waste so much time on that. All right. Okay. We should just go what we have now. All right. Sorry for the interruption. Please just continue your story. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, just uh, you know the, the chances that you were uh, going to run into um, mm -hmm. uh, somebody uh, in this particular context uh, was probably pretty good from about the 1500s onward uh, throughout much of the uh, uh, empire, uh, and uh, uh, from that point forward, um, you know, it was it was probably pretty difficult to live in a place that didn't have a uh, some kind of Sufi figure present, with the exception of maybe the more remote. Uh, village or rural environments. All right, perfect. Uh, let's just you know, go uh, to the basic definitions of uh, Sufism, again, for those who are uh, not so familiar with the subject. I mean, what is Sufism? Who are Sufis? Are they uh, simply the mystics or, or, or like, you know, uh, spiritualists? Uh, that today we uh, commonly refer to uh, like a general human experience uh, with sacred, uh, divine, or absolute. I mean, how can we define them in uh, basically briefly? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Sufism, you know, in for the Sufis themselves, their origins go back all the way to the uh, Prophet uh, Muhammad himself. Mm -hmm. Uh, who is, you know, sort of considered the eponymous founder in most ways of all Sufi orders. Uh, many of them then uh, track their lineage back through uh, his son-in-law, Ali ibn Abu Talib, um, and various uh, chains of mystics that then sort of descend uh, down from, from uh, his uh, spiritual uh, lineage. Um, Sufism also draws support from various kinds of uh, uh, Quranic uh, verses. Um, some examples uh, include the famous verse of light, um, which we see here that has a rhetoric about uh, uh, light upon light uh, as, as God's uh, 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 power and transcendence being uh, uh, connected with sort of endless light uh, that uh, can be sought uh, by some kind of mystical idea. Um, and uh, then there are other uh, verses, uh, such as a verse um, that uh, uh, God is nearer to us than uh, the blood in our jug jugular vein in our neck, uh, which suggests that God is imminently uh, with us. And uh, so mystics were able to sort of use this kind of an idea to build upon that. Um, there's also verses like, um, uh, chapter 3, verse uh, 7, um, uh, which suggests that some Quranic verses have very clear and obvious meanings, whereas others are allegorical or require you know, significant thought or uh, are not going to be fully understood uh, by the person who hears them the first time, thereby inviting you know, some sort of uh, you know, mystical or deeper uh, speculative path to be able to better understand God's meaning in the uh, Quran. 
Um, some Sufis locate um, their origins in a group known as the People of the Bench, um, or the uh, Ahlus Fa, um, who were sort of a group of people who sort of lived in a uh, open air shelter just outside of the Prophet's house. And whenever the Prophet needed something, um, they would just sort of jump up and, you know, uh, mm -hmm. help out or uh, sort of just sit around listening to everything he said and trying to gain a better understanding of Islam through him. And this sort of is sometimes cited as the model for future Sufi dedication to one's uh, master or sheikh or, or teacher. Um, from this point forward, mysticism you know, it began to evolve as a reaction against the things of this world, um, and instead a sort of a worry about the next. And uh, the earliest mystics are sometimes called weepers because they were always sort of weeping about their sins and the fact that this was an obstacle to their own uh, salvation. Um, this was radically transformed by one of the great female Muslim figures in mm -hmm. history. Uh, a woman named Rabia Ladawiya. Um, and she actually seems to have questioned this emphasis on asceticism and always weeping about one's sins and said, you know, the real, you know, the real issue in mysticism is about God's love. It's not about being afraid all the time and being, you know, uh, scared of your salvation and things like this. And she famously said, at one point, um, you know, God, if you, uh, uh, if you, if I, you know, tr uh, try to gain your favor by fear of hell, uh, you know, then just put me in hell. And if I'm doing everything for you out of the hope of gaining paradise, then don't grant me paradise. But if I uh, worship you solely for the love of yourself and your own sake, then decline me not your eternal peace. I'm paraphrasing, this isn't the exact word, sure. um, but you get the sense that, you know, she sort of had this remarkable insight that mysticism had to be about uh, mm -hmm. love. And from this point forward, most mystics followed her lead and began to develop mysticism much more along this lines of a relationship with the transcendent. Um, and this eventually would evolve into the idea of what are called the friends of God, um, or the awliya in Arabic, um, which draws support from the 10th chapter of the Quran. Um, and uh, it, it suggests that people who are able to establish this uh, loving relationship and to gain mm -hmm. a certain proximity to God's sort of transcendent um, imminence. Um, this allows them to sort of um, have an important uh, place in the cosmological worldview of Muslims. And this could get quite complex um, as well okay. as see um, later on. You, you are right. I mean, if, if, if uh, you know, one uh, asks what would be the most important concept in Sufism, probably the term uh, love or ashk uh, would uh, come to the fore, uh, that it is the central concept in uh, Sufism, which is also something similar to other uh, Christian concept of love, or even uh, other traditions, other like mystical traditions, also, um, you know, make an emphasis on on, on that. Um, that would be a good like a segue to uh, talk about a very brief history of uh, Sufism. You have already started saying that there were different traditions from the beginning, and an origin. Of it could be traced back to the times of uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad, but uh, there are discussions on that. We don't need to get into that, but we know that it has uh, its origin somewhere in the early uh, centuries of uh, Islam. But along the way, uh, you know, we uh, begin we begin to see uh, we began to see uh, like the emergence of different paths, different uh, Sufi orders, different. Uh, ideas, uh, some of them were even competing. Can you just uh, tell us again very briefly a uh, story or history of Sufism uh, before Ottoman Empire and then we need to quickly move to the uh, Empire, uh, Ottoman Empire and, and talk about uh, some of the other developments in the Empire. Given the fact that we have only um, you know 20 minutes left, uh, I just would like to go a bit faster. Okay? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it's it's fairly uh, uh, quick uh, uh, in in this regard. I mean, once you sort of get into um, this period after uh, Rabia, um, there's a whole host of uh, different uh, Sufi paths and thinkers that begin to emerge pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and by the time we get to the beginnings of the Ottoman period, um, there's a sort of whole host of different orders and, and teachers. Um, and in the case of the Ottomans, they inherit a number of very important Sufi groups, uh, mm -hmm. the most famous of which is the Meblevi order, um, mm -hmm. sometimes called the whirling dervishes um, in, uh, in, in Western contexts. Um, and uh, they have their center at Konya in what today is central Turkey. And uh, we see here in the pictures on the bottom, Right, uh, 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 Meblana Jalaluddin Rumi, the founder of the Meblevis, um, his tomb and, and the, the mosque complex is uh, uh, still very much there and uh, uh, still very much uh, uh, functioning. Uh, and uh, you can uh, see uh, that uh, uh, groups like the Meblevis began to develop various kinds of highly public practices. Um, such as uh, what were called the Sema ceremonies, which were often um, various kinds of uh, uh, ritual movements and sometimes musical accompaniments um, uh, that uh, sort of sent litanies and prayers to uh, music. And then the devotees would carry out various kinds of public rituals um, that were designed to sort of increase the devotees' proximity to God. And eventually, even members of the lay public um, would come to these ceremonies just to sort of try and get a taste of uh, what this experience was like. Um, and by the high Ottoman period, um, you know, it was very common for large groups of people to gather often on Thursday nights um, before the uh, uh, Friday holy day uh, to carry out these kind of all-night ritual performances and experiences, um, which were often then followed by a, uh, a meal for all the attendees hosted by the sheikh. And they were highly social and uh, uh, you know, very fun gatherings to be at if you were an early modern modern person. Mm -hmm. I mean, in that regard, I mean, one would talk about also what would be like this appeal, draw of Sufism and why people were attracted to it. I mean, it seems that, you know, while uh, philosophers and theologians tend to uh, see the world uh, as binary, as opposites, I mean, Sufis probably are not so happy with that and try to unite the opposites and then see things in, 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 in a holistic, uh, holistic uh, manner. Uh, uh, and and then they just you know, they uh, have a different uh, take uh, on, uh, on 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 that uh, on that issue, which is quite very um, uh, interesting. Uh, speaking of again Sufis and Sufi rituals and Sufi experience, just to get into um, the very practice of Sufism. That there is this you know relationship between master and disciple. So if you go, if you zoom into Sufi practice, at the very center of this practice, we see a relationship between a master and disciple, or a sheikh and, and dervish. Uh, and around that, we see uh, a Sufi convent that they just meet in particular places. Can we talk about this relationship between, again, Sufi, like sheikhs and dervishes, and then the places that they are meeting, and what are the characteristics or difference of these places, for example, difference from, say, uh, mosques on how the Sufi convent and then the relationship in that convent is different than, say, mosques. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I mean, this really could, you know, take on all kinds of uh, different forms, really. I mean, at the uh, basic level, the vast majority of devotees to some form of Sufism uh, never really advanced beyond the primary stages of the path. Um, it was uh, sometimes said of Sufi masters that they had, you know, tens of thousands of followers, and this, you know, in some cases may have been pretty close to the truth. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, most of them probably didn't advance beyond the sort of basic idea of trying to somehow be a better person through the Sufi path. 
Um, if you did become a sort of more advanced follower of Sufism and uh, sort of became a, you know, very close to the inner circle of the uh, shape, uh, then things would change markedly. Um, you often uh, did what was called an, an initiatic uh, ceremony or the bayah, uh, in which you sort of pledged your allegiance to a particular sheikh. And, um, you know, as the, the saying went, you basically commended yourself to him um, as uh, the corpse would be commended to the corpse washer for a, a funeral. Mm -hmm. And you would just sort of follow everything that the sheikh told you and uh, take every kind of advice that he would give you. Uh, even if it was the most strange and ridiculous thing, you, you would just go and do it with it because, um, you know, there was always some ulterior meaning behind it that you needed to learn. Um, and Sufi literature is always full of stories uh, of people who, you know, just said, well, that, re that request is so ridiculous and contrary to good behavior. Why would I do something like that? And then later on, they learned that the sheikh had an ulterior purpose in doing so. Um, and they had egg all over their face after this. Um, they, they uh, uh, you know, were embarrassed and they had to go and apologize and, and things like this. So the warning is always, you know, whatever the sheikh says, he's got a reason. You need to follow everything in the teacher, in the teachings. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, kind of the, the essence of the relationship. And uh, the picture I'm showing here is actually uh, kind of an interesting one because it's um, in a mountain pass in a very remote part of um, uh, uh, central Turkey. Um, and what this basically is, is it's sort of a combination uh, of a mosque, a Sufi lodge, and it even has sort of facilities for, you know, what we would call today a hotel. Um, so travelers coming and going could sort of stop in at this Sufi convent and sort of have a place to stay as they were traveling through this mountain pass. And uh, you know what this tells you is that um, often travelers were important parts of Sufism as well. And often they would pick up word of various kinds of Sufi teachers, even in remote places, and then spread news of them all throughout the empire. So sometimes people who lived in remote places could become surprisingly well known throughout many parts of the empire through these kinds of practices. So the relationships could range from the most casual stopover in, in a hotel inn kind of place mm -hmm. um, to you know, very in-depth relationships um, where you essentially were uh, in the proximity of the sheikh as much as you possibly could and sort of followed, you know, some very in-depth teachings. I mean, can we say that, you know, the Sufi sheikhs in some contexts especially and were seen as almost like, you know, uh, almost, um, you know, the messiahs or mahdis in a way, uh, in the sense that uh, they are the ones who are kind of bringing the paradise uh, to earth, you know, I mean, that's something, some other goal, I mean, some of this, like some of the other goals of like the Sufis, uh, that they are uh, looking for something else, they are looking for a different kind of knowledge, different kind of experience, uh, perhaps they are, not all of them, obviously, uh, but especially theoretically minded ones, they are the ones who are uh, attaining or experiencing um, you know, the experience of paradise on earth. Uh, and in that regard, I mean, they're expecting things from Sheikh as being healer and also redeemer. Right? Uh, can we connect, connect, can make this connection between like messianism and mysticism in that, not mysticism, but Sufism in that regard? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and actually, this is one of the controversial aspects, mm -hmm. doctrinally speaking, of Sufism as it emerged in the Ottoman period. Is, um, mm -hmm. uh, often, sheikhs were not viewed by ordinary people as sort of you know, mm -hmm. advanced mystical teachers. Um, they were viewed as sort of the local healer in an era before mm -hmm. doctors were sort of widespread and available to the population, often mm -hmm. some kind of uh, intervention from a higher power was the only way a woman could, you know, for example, save one of her children who had contracted a very serious disease. And sometimes people, you know, 
uh, contracted chronic conditions um, such as what was called mm -hmm. scrofula, um, a kind of like a horrible infection of the scalp and the head. Mm -hmm. And there are stories of sheikhs kind of, you know, licking their hands and rubbing them on the scrofula and the scrofula mm -hmm. goes away. Um, and then there's also a lot of stories of women who bring children to sort of the right. shake to be, um, you know, treated and then the mm -hmm. child miraculously recovers and the woman just kind of spreads this far and wide, despite the fact that the shake tries to be modest and say, you know, look, this is God answering your prayer, it's not me. And this was kind of actually the problem because in Islam, uh, God is supposed to be radically transcendent. There isn't supposed to be somebody on earth who can sort of mimic the, the powers of, of God. Uh, but the Sufis sort of did emerge sometimes into this kind of intermediary role, uh, right. where if you wanted to have some kind of channel to be heard by God, um, you would sort of use their institutions or their person uh, as a way of trying to get a better hearing. And in right. some periods of Ottoman history, various kinds of puritanical movements um, emerge uh, that criticize this and said the Sufis are trying to uh, take on a power that they're not entitled to um, in Islam. And therefore, we should shut down their lodges and mm -hmm. you know, banish them from uh, public society and return to the basic message of Islam, which is that there is God here and there is humanity here, and there's no sort of special intermediaries in between. Um, but these kinds of movements usually didn't gain enough traction to really um, uh, stomp Sufism out, although I would argue that they did um, ultimately evolve Sufism in the Ottoman period um, towards a much more doctrinally uh, uh, correct and uh, uh, careful presentation uh, of the issues. In the early Ottoman period, Sufis seemed to have no trouble with uh, kind of various kinds of uh, uh, wonder working, for, for instance, right. whereas by the later periods, um, Sufi leaders tended to downplay that as a distraction and say, you know, okay. this, this isn't the point. You know, you're supposed to be doing this. Awesome. I mean, um, that's perhaps also uh, important to talk about. Uh, people talk about like, you know, the, the places of Sufi shrines. I mean, they are somewhat an am ambiguous places where, uh, you know, many people from different walks of life and also from different religions are attending and expecting some healings. And that has always been the case uh, during the Ottoman Empire and also pre-Ottoman times. Uh, and this very fact of like, you know, the, the shrine of a holy man uh, is an idea which is transcending also Sufism and going all to other traditions, uh, traditions as well. Uh, speaking of, again, an Ottoman Sufi experience or, 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 or the experience of Sufi tradition Ottoman Empire, is there any particular uh, thing which is unique to Ottoman Sufism? Or can we talk about Ottomanization of Sufi tradition uh, in particular? I mean, was it anything special that Ottomans contributed to, to this tradition, other than, say, Middle Eastern or Safavid or, uh, or you know, Mukhal traditions? Well, and that's, that thing is, is the $64,000 <laughs> Um It is a major point of debate among people who study this. Um, I have some colleagues who argue that you know, Sufism, as we understand that today, is an entirely uh, Ottoman period or Mughal period creation. Um, and everything sort of has to be filtered through that lens. Um, other people argue that the Ottomans took a strong pre-existing tradition and merely sort of spread it more broadly. Um, so there's almost no agreement uh, on how to think about this. Um, I can only sort of give you, you know, what I think. Uh, and, you know, what I think is probably a position somewhere between these two poles. Um, mm -hmm. The Ottomans inherited an Islamic world that had been deeply fragmented by the turco mongol uh, invasions and migrations, mm -hmm. uh, which had destroyed a substantial part of the uh, Muslim institutions that had emerged during the formative period. 
And often the only people who were left throughout much of this vast region of the central parts of West Asia um, were people like the Sufis who could move around and uh, who were comfortable operating in these environments that were full of people who were non-Muslims or even only loosely Islamicized. Uh, Jalaluddin Rumi, right. for instance, is the son of but basically is a refugee from the Turco-Mongol invasions in Afghanistan who migrates all the way to Turkey. Um, and he settles there as a child. And in, in his following, you mm -hmm. find, according to the narratives, Christians and Jews, and maybe even a Zoroastrian floating around or two. And um, so, you know, they were comfortable with this kind of environment um, in a way that others were not. Uh, and uh, they were able to sort of uh, play the role of the people who could gradually Islamicize uh, these mixed populations of people who were only nominally Muslim, or in some cases not Muslim at all. They were willing to go out into these distant rural climes and sort of teach the faith to people in farmlands. There's a famous uh, text that I began my career with that documents how there's this guy who goes from Istanbul and wanders around in rural Asia Minor. And, you know, he goes out to the fields and literally instructs people on how to behave and uh, uh, what they should do with their animals and how you should revive, you know, wastelands to try and make the community more prosperous. And so often for many people um, who had very little connection with what we might call doctrinal Islam, you know, this was the person who could kind of teach them the basics, um, you know, since they often were, uh, you know, they didn't even sometimes have a local mosque uh, close by yes. to sort of uh, go and give their prayers in. Um, so, you know, these, uh, you know, were the kind of figures that sort of literally establish uh, Islam as the Ottomans knew it. Um, and it, in terms of the orders themselves, um, they developed a strong literary tradition of how to sort of teach these various kinds of Sufi orders principles to people. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they often uh, uh, translated many of the classic works in Arabic and Persian into Turkish and sometimes other languages as well, so they could be more accessible to people. So the Ottomans have to be given credit uh, for broadening the range and the understanding of Sufism uh, beyond certain elite, literate, uh, well-educated groups to encompass all walks of society. Um, and uh, they often were extraordinarily successful um, in that. Thank you very much. I mean, we are really approaching to the time uh, I know that there are, I mean, there are so many questions in uh, QA and also in the chats. Uh, there are some also complaints about the way we are, uh, you know, exercising this, uh, this, this uh, uh, conversation. But that is the format that we thought that it would be uh, nice to uh, have. Uh, there is no way for us to answer all the questions. Uh, still, however, I would like to take uh, some questions uh, before uh, the time. Uh, but I have still one more question uh, in order not to be, uh, you know, uh, not to have like an incomplete conversation uh, between uh, you and me at this point. That was uh, the, uh, the romanticization of Sufi history. That was about the romanticization of Sufi history. I mean, we uh, tend to see that history uh, something uh, flawless, something perfect all the time. But we all know that, you know, there were so many Sufis, so many Sufi traditions, so many Sufi orders who were in times on a collision course, uh, uh, who were in times uh, competing and, and fighting and whatnot. And they were like you know, claiming uh, or blaming each other as being heretics and whatnot. Um, can we also talk about some of the imperfections, if you have any examples from history, uh, with regard to uh, that history very briefly. And after that, I want to like, you know, answer or at least you know, ask you a few questions uh, coming from our audience. Well, it should probably be stressed here that the Sufis themselves were, you know, the first to often point out their own imperfections and failings. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a powerful sense of humility is at the core uh, right. of Sufism, and even the greatest sheikh um, would 
you know, basically say, you know, oh, I, even I mess up once in a while, and, you know, here are some of the, the dumb things I've done, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, things like this. Um, and, uh, you know, there's even a famous story in one Sufi manual that I read where um, the prophet Musa, uh, Moses, right. uh, uh, was going up to the mountain on Sinai to you know, receive uh, various kinds of uh, revelations from God. And uh, God, you know, told him at one point to go down and find the most abject and worthless uh, creature that he could and bring him back. And so Moses went down and looked around until he found a very mangy dog that was really sick and about to die. And, uh, you know, then he started bringing it back up the mountain and the dog kind of looked up at him and spoke and he says, you know, will you really put me before my creator, you know, in this kind of a state, uh, you know? And Moses said, you know what, you're right. He let the dog go and he goes back to God and he says, God, I am the most abject and worthless being. And God said, I'm glad you figured that out because if you had, I would have cut you off from all of this on the spot because you wouldn't have gotten it right. So, uh, you know, this is obviously an apocryphal story, but it's one that sort of expresses the Sufi worldview almost perfectly. And uh, Sufis also had sometimes problems with political power. If they got too close to, say, uh, the Ottoman ruling class, uh, they sometimes began to occupy a position um, that was at odds yeah. with their own humility. Um, and often Sufis would criticize other, you know, uh, Sufis for getting too close to worldly power um, mm -hmm. and demanded that they step back from that. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's not so much even what we think of them, it's that they themselves were always constantly in a form of self-criticism. And that's what I think is really the greatest thing about them, um, is, you know, they never, you know, seem to get too full of themselves, and they, they always brought things down to earth. Mm -hmm. And I think that's always what I appreciated most about them, is they came across, as this entire lecture series will point <laughs> out, as eminently human. Um, even yes. if they occupied a status and piety and sanctity that seemed to be far above their contemporaries at the time. Awesome. Thank you very much, John. I mean, I'm going to be like, you know, again, selecting a few questions from, uh, from, uh, from the audience. Again, there is no way to be, to do a justice to all the questions. Uh, uh, nevertheless, again, I have to pick a few of them. Uh, one is asking, let me just ask a three questions to you at once, and then you choose however you want to uh, answer. One is uh, asking about the role of woman uh, in Sufism, uh, the place of woman in Sufism. And then the, another one is asking about uh, uh, whether there is a, a concept of uh, karma uh, uh, in, uh, in Sufism. And another uh, big question is about asking about like the current contemporary uh, status of Sufism um, in the world today. I mean, again, you have, don't, you don't have much time Please just try to entertain some of these questions. Yeah, yeah, I, certainly. And I'm glad that somebody asked about, you know, the, the role of women in Sufism, because this is something that's only just starting to emerge, and it's hugely important. Um, and, you know, my own research in the manuscript library has turned up some astonishing finds. Um, for example, I found mm -hmm. a book mm -hmm. that's supposedly written mm -hmm. by a male author, uh, but he derived about half of the book um, through his mother, who was actually mm -hmm. much more highly placed in the Sufi order than he was. And so we can sort of get all this inside information about how the women of the Sheikh's family functioned. Uh, they were very much ensconced in the uh, everyday life of the order. Uh, they were often ranked higher uh, than the men in this regard mm -hmm. due to their proximity uh, uh, to the Sheikh and the, their devotion. Um, uh, to uh, the Sheikh. And, uh, you know, we often find in the hagiographies, the, the narratives of the Sheikh's lives, a lot of the stories are clearly said by women. Um, and they sort of explain something that they saw the Sheikh do that was evidence of their uh, sanctity. And then at the end of the narrative, they'll often say, and you make sure that I'm the one who told them. Um, so, uh, you know, women play a very important role 
And uh, people who observed the Sufi orders in action, both people who were you know, friendly to them and sometimes even mm -hmm. those who were mm -hmm. hostile to Sufism, uh, they often either noted or complained that a huge number of the followers of the sheikhs has um, exercises mm -hmm. and uh, uh, everyday Muslim life in a way that the mosque might have sometimes not given them the same level of question, I think, in this regard. And mm -hmm. one that's very important um, uh, to consider. Um, I think the next question was about Sufism's contemporary place in the world today. Um, and uh, to make a long story short, it's still very much around and still plays a, a very major role in uh, Muslim life. Um, but uh, uh, the advent of uh, uh, the Enlightenment in various forms worldwide um, did sort of take some of the more supernatural and mystical aspects of Sufism and put them under uh, scrutiny um, in a way uh, that sort of weakens Sufi orders in some ways. Uh, the Republican uh, project in Turkey with Ataturk um, was often quite hostile to Sufism and actually closed most of the orders forcibly after 1925. And many of them had to go underground and couldn't operate uh, publicly so easily anymore. And there's still uh, elements of that even floating around today, although it's been dramatically changed in the 21st century. Um, so in the minds of many Muslims, uh, and even those who did not place Islam at the forefront of their consciousness, um, you know, Sufism, you know, was, was viewed as sort of, you know, sometimes backwards or, you know, sort of outside the, uh, 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 the proper way uh, religion should be done in the modern era. Um, that, I would argue, is turning around pretty rapidly today, as it's become clear that, in fact, the Sufis have some very important lessons to teach all of us, as I, I think, you know, some of what I've said has uh, uh, hopefully uh, proven. Um, and also, better understanding of modern psychology, for instance, suggests that the Sufis really were on to something. Um, in terms of their practices as to how to sort of treat uh, uh, various kinds of uh, uh, psychological conditions um, and uh, how to make people feel better about their place in both this world um, and the next. Um, so I think now people are starting to move away from this sort of hard enlightenment idea, anything that doesn't deal with the real time in various kinds of fields and places, mm -hmm. and could play a very real role um, in maybe uh, developing that further in the future. I want to say there was another question I might be overlooking, am I? That was the question about like, uh, whether there was any kind of a uh, friend. <laughs> Um, uh, but, uh, you know, my sense, um, given that I'm not a, an expert in the Vedic traditions, um, is that uh, uh, mm -hmm. karma sort of, uh, to some extent, involves uh, 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 some kind of reincarnation, um, uh, which would uh, probably not pass muster um, in Islam in any meaningful way. Um, but the idea uh, that your actions um, play an important part um, in uh, how you will fit into the religious uh, tradition, and even the way you think about things will play an important part in, in that tradition, um, is uh, definitely part of the, uh, the issue. And we often have narratives of Sufis who uh, decide at some point you know, that they're living a dissolute life that's too tied to you know, this world or to uh, issues that are, should not be their proper concern. And they probably come running into the Sufi Sheikh's house and often interrupt him in the middle of their, what they're doing to repent and seek his assistance. And he's kind of a, it's, a, it's sort of a very common disjuncture moment for many people who become Sufis, that they're doing their normal lives one day and then all of a sudden they just realize through some kind of experience that everything they're doing is meaningless. Um, and that they really need to completely transform themselves um, if they're going to be able to move forward with their lives. So I'm not sure that's really a good answer to the question, in part because we need someone who can really do that Indian subcontinent uh, material well, and uh, there's uh, you know some sort of a transcendent ideal. Um, you know, it's 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 problematic in some ways, but there is, I think, a grain of truth to it um, 
in others. Um, that uh, no, uh, that that not all humans are going to be satisfied with just the sort of basic prescriptions mm -hmm. of their religion and sort of carrying out the basic duties and then just going home and going about their lives. There are always going to be people who, for whom this is not enough, and they need yes. uh, to have more to work with. And, and this is you know, sort of the, the key to it. Thank you. Thank you very much for this <clears throat> fascinating really talk and responses and sharing your wisdom and erudition for, for, of years uh, with us today. Um, as uh, we promised at the beginning, we were going to deal with particularities and also universals of uh, humans uh, of the Ottoman Empire. And I hope that uh, by now, after an hour, I meant to actually like, stop almost 20, 20, 15, 20 minutes ago, but I couldn't. Uh, because of the uh, demands coming from uh, our audience and also your passionate, uh, you know, interest into the subject, I couldn't st stop. Uh, yeah. But I well, hope... and this poor one full of thoughts has to take <laughs> this, uh, blame like for that. that because I think I got a little too into the beginning and uh, didn't realize I was taking up too much time. Uh, no, so it's not not your fault. The humility issue comes in here, and I have to take the blame. <laughs> it's, it it was perfectly fine, and as I said, I mean, I hope that we all got uh, some glimpses, some tidbits of wisdoms uh, about uh, the humans uh, of the Ottoman Empire. And I hope that we are going to continue this series uh, next week uh, uh, about uh, Ottoman scientists, uh, from Sufis to scientists. We are going to move next week. And thank you very much uh, to you, John, one more time. And thanks for all the participants who have been, uh, who have been like, you know, uh, intentively uh, following us and also making some suggestions also to improve uh, this series. And I should say, have a great uh, day, uh, be well, uh, and stay well. Bye-bye. Thank you to everybody.